<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to just wait one or two more minutes to see if some more people come. Uh, but I put in the chat the git commands that you should need to get this lecture, um, as well as the conda command to install all the things that we'll be needing today, most of which should already be installed. Um, yeah, so get that started uh, and and maybe we can do a poll in a minute to just make sure everyone has everything installed successfully. All right, so I'm just going to launch the poll. If you uh, if you're still working on it, just just wait until it's done before you answer. Okay, so I'm just going to start uh, describing, it looks like most people are able to successfully install stuff. And if, if you're not able to, um, maybe you can get some help in the chat from the other TAs. Uh, but I'm gonna start talking about what, we'll, what we're gonna do today. Um, so the goal of this lecture is to take a data set. Uh, so this is gonna be an RNA-seq data set, but something that, um, the kind of data set that I think a lot of people run into very often, which is um, a just a table of numbers, right? A table of numbers where the columns might indicate different samples and rows might indicate different genes, for instance. But I think that there's many, um, no problem, David, uh, but there's many um, different, uh, many different things that, that will, you know, you end up with a table of numbers. So we're just gonna go through sort of how you would um, start to get to know a data set using Python. Um, okay, so everyone, uh, hopefully if you, if you did this Git checkout, hopefully you should have this um, notebook. You can, you can follow along with me or you can uh, just watch and you know, try it out on your own later. And the data set that we're going to be looking at is a, um, a raw RNA-C count table and the experiment that I got this from, I don't, I don't know that much about it, uh, but it's RNA-seq from mouse T cells. And the T cells have been challenged um, with different, uh, different numbers of times with peptides. Uh, and um, that's to simulate exhaustion or to stimulate exhaustion actually. Um, so that's, that's the data set we're gonna be looking at. Um, so here I just have the, uh, so you can actually run bash commands in a Jupyter um, cell. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily um, recommend trying to install stuff this way, but you can definitely do things like this where you like make a directory um, or and get data. And so this is how you would get this data set from um, a terminal if you have uh, wget installed. Um, but when I, I put it on, it was a small enough data set that I just put it on the GitHub. So, so hopefully um, if you've pulled this branch, you should all have this data um, available in this data folder. Um, so we're going to start with uh, just importing all of the things that we need. Uh, so this includes um, pandas, numpy, 
matplotlib for plotting, seaborn for plotting. In addition, we're going to use um, this package called uh, scikit-learn or sklearn, um, which includes a ton of uh, machine learning functions that are extremely helpful and make machine learning extremely simple and useful. Um, today, what we're going to do with it, though, uh, is simply um, we're going to use these sub modules called decomposition and pre-processing. Uh, decomposition we're going to use to do principal component analysis or PCA and the pre-processing we're going to use just for sort of rescaling the data because it has some really convenient um, stuff there. Um, the other package we're going to use I don't think has been mentioned but it's it's called scipy and specifically scipy.stats and scipy is extremely uh, useful, it's, uh, the syntax is extremely similar to NumPy, um, but where NumPy has mostly just like math calculation stuff, SciPy has a lot, a ton of statistics. So we're going to use this for things like z-scoring and t-tests today. Um, finally, I'm just, I just set up this, uh, I like at the top of the script to set up how I want most of my plots to look if I have something that I want common between them. So I like Arial font, so I don't have to mess with it. I like the background to be white, and I, I think the fonts should be a little bigger than, than they are by default. And then um, this line, I cannot stress enough how much I like this, this single line of code and how, mu how much headache it saves you. So what this does is when you save your plots from Matlab, Matplotlib, if you don't do anything to them, often it'll cut off pieces of your plot if you have stuff plotted outside of the, the main sort of axes. Um, but if you include this line, it'll automatically bound the saving um, box to, so that it includes everything. So I strongly suggest that you, you just add this at the top of at any script where you're going to be saving plots. Um, okay, so let's, let's check out the data a little bit to start. Um, so here we have a it's a data set of uh, just raw RNA-seq counts from mouse T-cells that have been challenged with a uh, vehicle, so nothing. Um, a single peptide, uh, like um, a peptide once, a single, you know, a peptide that they'll respond to once, or peptides that they'll respond to multiple times. And basically the idea is that number three here is like a um, T-cells will enter an exhausted state because they keep being stimulated with the same peptide. And that these are just two different controls that we can use to try to figure out what is unique to exhausted T cells. Uh, so we're going to use pandas to read in this data. Um, and let's just, oh, I have this already. So let's just sort of take a look at it and see, see what it's like. Uh, so we can do df.head um, to uh, to just to see sort of like what the structure of it is. Oh, sorry, let me go into this. So this is a tab delimited file. So we have to specify that the, the separations between columns are tabs and not, for instance, commas. Um, and also I, I happen to know just from glancing at this file that the first column that was, um, the first column uh, is the G names. So what we can do is we can give that as an index to, um, this data frame, and now we can call things directly by the gene name instead of having to know what number the the gene um, is. Uh, the other thing, the other thing that's good about this is that now this entire table is just numbers, right? It's just counts. There's no column that's full of gene name strings. Uh, okay, so the top of the, the top of this data frame looks great. Another thing we can say is, okay, well these are just I think these are all like long non-coding RNAs. So let's make sure that there's stuff in here that's not just these long non-coding RNAs. So let's grab five, instead of the top five rows, let's grab five random rows. Uh, so the way you can do that with pandas is with dot sample. Um, and you can give it how many rows that you want. And this dot sample is really super useful for if you're ever doing um, simulated stuff or subsampling your data, things like that. Uh, so, we can grab five rows. Okay, so we're seeing other other gene names, and if we run this many times, it's going to be different every time. Um, and we can see that the uh, you know the uh, column names are pretty standard, so that's great. Um, one thing I like to do whenever I get a new data set is look for duplicated. Uh, index names. So the, here would be duplicated gene names. So basically, if we have a duplicated gene name. Um, that's bad because why didn't those counts just get collapsed together, right? Maybe there's something wrong there. 
so the way we do that is, so we can take the df.index. Um, so this is, this will just sort of print out what the, what the index is. You, you can say index duplicated. And so now this will give you a, um, an array where it's telling you whether each element in the index is duplicated, right? Uh, and so if you want to see the elements of the index that are duplicated, what you can do is pass this as a mask for df.index, right? So now this is going to just, re so that's what I have down here. So this is just gonna return the items in the index that were duplicated. So unfortunately, what it looks like here is that this uh, table has been saved in Excel because Excel often changes a lot of genomes into dates. Um, and it does it in such a way that we don't actually know, we can't actually turn it back because multiple, um, basically multiple genes have now been turned into the 2nd of March or the 1st of March. Um, so this is a problem and this is something that, you know, if you really needed this data set, you'd have to contact the authors to get a copy of this that has not been through Excel. Uh, but we're what we're going to do for today is just um, remove uh, remove anything with duplicated with du these duplicated genes, and if anything else has been excelified, we're just going to ignore it. Um, so what we can do is we can use this drop duplicates uh, method, so df dot index dot drop duplicates, and we we want to if we don't want to keep a random one. So what this will do by default is it'll just keep the first time it sees something like this. But we don't want to keep any of them. We don't need any March, you know, Marches in this. Uh, so this will be the drop duplicate, like this will return the index without duplicates. And then we can pass that into this dot lock um, thing where the index should be. So if I was going to be extra clear and extra verbose, um, I would say comma, give me all columns. So it's saying, give me, give me these uh, indexes, but then give me all the columns. And now we've redefined the data frame to just have um, uh, non-duplicated indexes. Okay, so so that's that's the first thing we can do. Um, another thing we can do is we can try to use the column names to make a sort of sample annotation table, which will be really useful later when we're trying to compare things based on um, the treatment of what happened to that uh, you know that column. So here we have df.columns. Another way to um, say this would be list df if you wanted in a list form, for instance, for instead of an index form. Um, and uh, okay, so what do we have here? We have five replicates of this multi-pep um, uh, treatment, four replicates of this no-pep treatment, and four replicates of this one x-pep treatment. Um, so that's great. So uh, what we can do is we can create the annotation just based on these names. So it's, this is really nicely um, formatted, so we can just do it based on these names. Um, so I'm going to use a, a list comprehension here. You could definitely do this with um, a for loop. But what this is, is um, what this is basically saying is uh, go into each of these indices one at a time in order. Um, split it based on this underscore. So this will turn it into, let's see what this looks like just if I, if I do that part. So if I take out this one. So then we have this list, list of lists, right, where it's splitting it based on the underscore. Um, and then you can just grab the second element, which, you know, Python zero index, so it's zero, one. Uh, and so that's going to grab the second element. And now these are our different treatments, right? Um, so I made a dictionary with that saying treatment to this list because dictionaries are really easy to turn into data frames. Um, so what I've done is I save that in labels and then I have, um, uh, you can just hand that dictionary to pandas.dataframe. Um, and I wanted to have, I wanted to match up with the actual column names so that it's very easy to compare my sample annotation um, table and my actual read count table. Whoop, okay. First. Okay, so this is the table that I get from that. So this is, it, it took this dictionary and basically turned it into this, um, you know, column in the data frame. 
And then because I specified the index, uh, now that's the index of this as well. So this is going to make this really easy for us to um, work, work with later. Um, great. Uh, so I want to highlight this method here called value counts. Um, value counts, okay, so here for instance, you know, I, I just counted from looking at it that there's five and then four and then four, but let's say this was, you know, 300 samples and we want to know how many replicates of each uh, treatment we, we have. So that's what value counts does. It basically says um, for all of the different values in this column, uh, what are the counts of them, right? So we can, we have to, you have to specify one um, column to do this. And uh, so this can, this will tell us how many replicates of each we have. Um, another thing that I wanted to, oh, do I have this? Sorry, I deleted this. This is, but this is a, a really, really important um, uh, method because sometimes you have something like this. Right. And if I just looked at this just, you know, at a glance, I would have, I would, I wouldn't really, it wouldn't really be obvious that there are three different things here. Right. But when I went to actually try to process this and group them by true or false, um, that's going to be a big problem. But so what you can do is use value counts to, you know, rigorously say, oh, okay, I have three different trues and they're only there one time. Um, so that's, uh, that's a good, good way to look at um, categorical data. Okay, so another thing I want to do is um, not just have this treatment with these three different uh, treatments, but also specify um, whether something is this multi PEP treatment, which I think is like the exhausted state, or if it's the single PEP or no PEP treatments. So I want to sort of group those two together. There's lots of different ways you could add that column. But the way that I did it here is this quite this quite simple, um, again, list comprehension, where we have this um, experimental design treatment, right? And that this is the content of that, uh, that this column. So I just, uh, this list comprehension is saying, is the word multipep in the index for each index in this column, right? So it goes through one by one and it says, yes, it, true, it's there, false, false, true, false, false, true, et cetera. Um, and so, It'll give us this uh, in order, this list of um, whether whether this term is there. And so now we can look, call that that column called exhaustion. And so now we have this experimental design um, data frame where we have we have the treatments in two different ways, which we might want to use them in different ways later. Okay, so now so that's sort of the um, sample annotation. Now we figured out our sample annotations. So now let's look at the actual quality of the RNA-seq experiment. Um, so one of the first things, let's just remind you what the, what the data frame actually looks like. Um, it looks like this, right? So all these samples as columns and all these genes as rows. Uh, so one thing we might wanna say is how many reads were there per sample? So for that, we can use this sum method here. Um, and we can save that in, here I'm saving it in a reads per column variable. Uh, just because I'm going to want to look at this again later. So if we run that, um, we can see, okay, you know, it, it'll tell us per column how many, what the total sum is of the whole column. I can see just from a glance that it's a similar, um, there's the same number of digits, so we're not, you know, we're not a factor of 10 off from anything. Uh, so that's great. Um, but this is, you know, this is kind of hard to look at, so I'd rather look at this in a, um, in a histogram kind of way, actually. So to do that, um, we're gonna take this reads per column, uh, this is a series, so it's like, you know, a column or a vector of data, uh, and we're gonna put that into the Seaborn dist plot, which is, you know, for looking at distributions. Um, there are 13 samples, and I kind of want each sample to be um, visible on this distribution. So here I've set the number of bins, which is like, you know, the, basically the width of these bars to 13. Um, and just for clarity, I'm doing the, I'm, I'm specifying the X and Y label here. Um, so, so yeah, so let's run this and just look at the distribution. You can like, like this um, SNS.displot 
you like this is something that I just use, you know, 40 times a day, and it can be as simple as just that, right? Like I just added the bin so that I, I have a little bit more resolution there. But you know, this is like the best line of code for getting to know your data completely. Um, one, maybe I should uh, be a little more consistent with this. Um, so what this line of code generates is an axes object. Um, and if you can get to know the axes object, you'll be so much happier. But uh, basically we can set that to ax and then say set um, the methods for ax versus plot are a little different. Maybe I'll try to be consistent with ax actually. So set x label and set y label. Um, and so that's, you know, a nice, a nice little plot, right? Like this can, this can be shown to your coworkers. Uh, okay, so per sample, it looks like the samples are pretty well grouped together. Um, so now let's look at um, the number of reads per gene, right? So before we were summing all of the numbers down, which is so summing all of the rows per column. And so the code for that would have been, um, if we wanna be totally explicit, is setting this access parameter to uh, zero, but that's the default. Uh, so if we want to sum the other direction, we want to sum across all the columns uh, for each row, that's going to be axis equals one. Now I think that um, basically I have to check every single time whether axis, whether across the columns is one or zero. I don't know, you get used to it after a while. I don't think that there's a whole ton of logic to it, uh, but just don't be afraid to like try one, see if it's right, and then flip it to the other one. That's not a big deal. Uh, okay, so we have reads per gene. That's what this, that's what this generates. Um, so if we do df.sum axis equals one, so this is now um, summing across uh, the columns, um, and we can look at that distribution. And so this distribution um, is basically so blown out at zero that we can't see any genes that have reads. Um, so another way that I think is good to look at this is, um, to use this sort values method. Uh, so actually we could, there's a couple different ways we can do this, right? We can just print out um, df.sum axis equals one sort values, but we actually had this saved in a variable. So we could also say like this. Um, oh, sorry. I should probably be running all these. Okay, so what sort values will do, again, so this is just a, um, this is just a series, right? So it knows that um, the, the only content in this uh, variable is, you know, one column of content. And so what this will do is it'll sort, it'll sort the values and it'll try to figure out how to do that. So if you gave it strings inside the column, it'll try to figure out how to sort those. If you gave it integers or floats or whatever, it'll try to figure that out. Um, and usually, you know, most of the times it, it figures it out great, uh, but there are so you can do things like um, tell it where to put missing values, um, tell it to, you know, do ascending order or descending order. Um, but this is a good way just to just to look at this. Um, so there's a couple of things to notice. For sure, we have a lot of genes where the count is zero. Um, another thing to notice is um, there's this one gene, which uh, when I looked up, I couldn't really make sense of. I think it's a long non-coding RNA that has 10 times as many reads as any other gene. It has, I think it has, this has 50 mil, 53 million reads compared to the 5 million reads of the next highest gene. So I think personally, this is probably something good to remove. Um, and there's lots of different ways we can do that. So, so let's go over this. Uh, I really like this uh, method here, this IDX max. So we have this, uh, reads per gene um, uh, variable, right, that has the, has the reads per gene. Um, and we can say, what is the max value of this? And we know that it's this value here, right? So what IDX mask does is um, it doesn't pull out the value of the maximum value it pulls out the index associated with the maximum value. So it pulls out this. So this is super useful. Uh, so, so here I've listed 
four, four different ways that we can actually get rid of this gene. So we can say everything, take out everything but the top count gene is, um, is, is what we would call this. So you can say the df.index and you can treat these basically like a set. You know, when you do a set, you have intersection, you have difference, you have union, things like that. So you can say, take the um, difference with this. So we have to put this into some sort of iterable, right? We have to make it like a, a comparable, um, you can make it into a list or a set or something. Uh, and then we take this, the reads per gene IDX max. This isn't going to look any different because it's just the index minus this one index, th this one gene name, right? Um, so then we can re-index uh, the data frame with this, and this will, uh, again, by default, do it uh, as rows. Um, the other thing you can do is say, find me all of the, um, you can use this basically dot lock as like a filtering uh, technique. So you can say, find me every row where the sum is lower than this number, right? And we know this number from here. Um, so let's just look at what this looks like actually. Uh, so that's mostly just giving out true, right? It's just saying true, 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 true. And except for this gene right here, it's not, it's going to um, say true. And so if we re uh, do this lock with this, that that's a valid way to filter that out. Um, you can also say uh, the same kind of thing, but uh, just not equal to this number. That's going to work too. Um, and the other thing, I, li I like this. Uh, this is um, pretty explicit too. Uh, you know, if you're going back and reading this code, this is, this is very explicit and easy to see what it is. Um, you can do this list comprehension and say, give me every index for an index in the index if the index is not this gene. So again, this is going to be like a long, uh, it's going to be a big long list of indices, um, ex everything except this. Okay, so that's how to filter um, uh, these things. So, um, uh, yes, this is, there's one important note here. So, the three of these can be run uh, an indefinite number of times, and it'll and it won't change anything, right? It'll only take out this one gene, um, and you can run it again and again, and then it just will, it, it'll stop changing the data frame. However, if you use this IDX max method, um, it'll always find the index of the high of the top gene. And so every time you run these two lines of code, it'll keep removing the gene with the highest count. Um, so that is, uh, very important if you're, it's not important if you put everything in a Python script and you run it once, that's not an issue. But if you're like me and you're constantly playing around with data in a Jupyter notebook, it's very important to sort of keep in the back of your mind what you can do, um, what you might be able to run over and over again without messing up the data. Um, great, so, uh -oh. oh, did I not, let me go back and deduplicate, sorry. All right, so that, that was an issue because I didn't actually run that deduplicated um, gene, uh, removing duplicate genes. And when you use this reindex thing, it can't reindex if it has two copies of the same um, of the same index or more. Okay, so we've removed that one gene. Let's see. Let's see what that did to the counts per um, the counts per sample. So. Uh, I don't know, kind of looks slower. I feel like there's more threes and fours and fives. Now it's more twos and threes. Um, let's look at it as a histogram though. So what we can do here is we can say, okay, so the current um, sum after we remove that very high, high red gene, uh, we're gonna label that after removing big gene. Um, we have our old variable where reads per column was, was saved before. So we're gonna label that before removing big gene. Um, we're gonna put the legend, uh, what this means is like this one is in relation to the axis that it's being plotted on. So 1.01 means take it all the way to the end of the x axis and a little bit more. Uh, and zero means, you know, the bottom of the y axis. So just put it right here. Um, and then we're, 
yeah, just, just adding some labels. Um, so this looks pretty good, right? So the orange uh, to the blue, it kind of looks like just a shifted over, shifted down distribution, which is what we'd expect, right? We removed 53 million reads from this. Um, but the issue is, did this, what we really want to see is, did this removing this one gene affect one sample more than the others, right? Because what's the number here? This is like 44 million reads. You know, let's say one of those samples was responsible for most of those reads. We really want to know, was this high, was this high up sample here all of a sudden at the bottom now? Because that's, that we might want to keep an eye on that sample. Uh, so to do that, we're going to use this um, reg plot visualization. I think that stands for uh, regression plot. Um, and we're going to, um, what's nice about regplot is you can just give it two vectors and they don't have to be in the same data frame. You can just give it any two vectors and it'll, on the x-axis and y-axis, it'll go one by one and just sort of plot out um, the relationship between those two vectors. Uh, so that's super useful also. So we can say, the, you know, the previous reads per column before the filtering, we're going to put on the x-axis. I can explicitly say that, but it's just sort of by default. First thing you put in is the x-axis, second thing you put in then is the y-axis. Um, and then we can give the current reads per gene on the y-axis um, and just make sure that it's not the case that one of these dots is way off that center line. So that's great and it looks like um, no particular sample was overly affected by filtering this, this gene. Great. Um, Okay, I'm going to I'm going to pause for ten seconds uh, and just see if I've totally lost people. So I'm going to give just an opportunity for people to ask, like, what's a data frame kind of question, or you know, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give ten seconds and drink my tea. All right, awesome. Uh, okay, so now we're going to, so now we sort of figured out, um, we removed that big gene. Now let's, let's talk about genes with very low coverage, right? So what we can do for that is, um, so we have this df.sum again, which is reads per gene. And we can say, which of these is, um, for which genes has a total read count greater than zero? So now that's going to give us true false uh, as an index. And basically, I want to just um, remove any genes that had a count of zero, because that's, uh, that's just a, basically an artifact of like what genome you use to map to. It's, it has nothing, you know, genes with zero aren't present in our um, experiments. So we're just going to take them out. So to do that, we can do this again, dot lock. Um, so df dot lock. And we can say, basically what this is saying is, again, we filter genes, then columns, right? And we can say, give us um, just genes where the sum of that gene is greater than zero and give us all the columns. Um, so we can set uh, DF to that. And well, let's first look at the shape. So right now we have 52,000 rows, so 52,000 genes. And uh, afterwards, after filtering for zero count genes, we have 27,000. So we lost um, 24,000 genes that had zero counts. Great. Um, all right, so now that we got rid of that zero counted stuff, maybe that was what was accounting for this, right? This huge spike at zero, so we couldn't even see the other genes. So let's run, um, let's look at the distribution again, right? Well, that doesn't seem to be the problem. Um, do this again. It seems like it's still a highly, uh, you know, there's still many, many genes that have maybe one, two, three, four, five reads, right? But they go up to 50 million. So it's really hard for us to look at all of this on the same distribution, basically. Uh, so let's try to zoom in here. You know, we know, we know a lot of, most genes are not going to have 50 million reads. Um, so we really want to zoom into this low, um, low number of read distribution area. So for that, oh, so uh, let me just quickly say why I do this KDE equals false. It's not super important, um, but 
Oh, okay. It hasn't. Oh, no. Um, basically, when you do a KDE, what that'll do is it'll try to fit basically a normal distribution to the data that you're plotting. Um, here, I know this isn't normally distributed. I don't need to look at this. And also what it'll do is it'll scale um, your y-axis into a proportional scale, not into an absolute number scale. Uh, and I kind of um, want to uh, know the actual number of genes of what's, you know, that have different counts. So I said KD equals false. Um, so here I'm just going to, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. So the way that I do that, let me, let me do this. Uh, so the way that we're going to do that is by setting the X limit and you can set it after at, you basically set it after you initiate the plot. Um, the other thing I want to do is instead of just specifying the number of bins that I want, because I'm not really sure what number of bins that I want, um, I would like to specify basically where in the X axis I would like to cut the bins. Um, so to do that, I'm using this super helpful function, which is um, numpy.arange, numpy.arange. Uh, and what numpy.arange does is it's, it'll give you, um, you can give it a start point and an end point and a step point. Um, and it'll give you the, um, an array where uh, from your start to your end, it steps by your step point, right? So here, I don't want to look at the 5 million range. I, I'm maybe interested in this, what do I have here? The 100,000 reads range. Um, and I want a bin every thousand reads. Uh, I do this uh, one because again, just like everything in Python, um, when you do numpy.a range, it's inclusive, it will plot to zero, but exclusive on the, on the second number you give it. So like, you know, like just like range. Um, so I just want to go a little bit over so that 100,000 is actually shown here. Uh, so what this will do is now, um, if you give it this array, this is why Seaborn's so great. It's so uh, flexible. Um, maybe that's Matplotlib too. Uh, you, you don't just specify the number of bins, you actually specify where you want the bins to be. And so that's what, that's what um, this is where it'll put the bins. So we're only gonna look up to 100,000. So I set the X limit from zero to 100,000. And we can plot this. Uh oh, it looks very different. Ah, sorry, I think I didn't actually filter for a zero. No, I did. Interesting. Okay, sorry, let's also set the uh, Y range. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay, so we, um, so we know that this is what, 15,000 genes only have a super, super small number of reads. Um, so let's, we care what's happening to, let's say 200 genes. Okay, so that's a little, that's a little tall, so let's say 1,000 genes. Okay, cool, that looks better. Um, Great. So, uh, okay. So this is this is giving us a better idea of sort of what the distribution of of read counts are per gene. Um, let's zoom in even a little bit more because we really what we want to do is filter out low coverage genes because we don't have a lot of confidence in low coverage genes to be able to do statistics on them. We're not confident in whatever statistics we we do to them. So it's better to just filter them out and then we don't have to correct for multiple hypotheses um, on those genes. Um, so we can zoom in even more. So now we're just going to be looking at things that have up to 200 reads total per gene, uh, and we care what happens to up to 1,000 genes. Um, and you can see, again, it's this very, very steep um, slope where there's thousands and thousands of genes that have fewer than, let's say, 50 reads. Um, so one other way of looking at this, though, would be to take the log 10 of the number of genes. So let's look at how we would do that. Um, so what we can do is we can use the fabulous numpy log 10 um, function. The issue, uh, as you know, is that you can't take the log of zero. So um, when we actually do have zero, uh, that all turns into negative infinity. 
So what we can do is we can really what we want is zero. We want zero to mean a missing value, right? We don't actually know that there's zero copies of that gene in that sample. We just we know we didn't measure it. So that can just be a missing value. Um, so what we can do is we can replace, we can use this replace function um, where, I mean, just in case there's for some reason positive infinity, um, we can replace positive infinity or negative infinity with missing values, which is numpy.nam. Um, and so let's look at um, gene sums. Uh, sorry, how do I say this? Uh, so let's try to look at the distribution in this log 10 space. Um, ah, sorry. All right, let's, let's first look at this, actually this gene sums in log 10 space. Um, so what we can do is again, just like this plot, just like that. Uh, and so now this, this is something that's much easier to look at, right? Um, what we see for sure is that we have this actually kind of a nice normal distribution right around 10 to the four, 10 to the five. So that's like what, 10,000, 100,000, something like that. But that there's this still this big ugly thing uh, down here of low read count things. Um, another thing we can do is make sure that this is the same pattern that's happening in each sample. So, um, so we have this, uh, this thing here where we took the log 10 of the data frame and then we replaced infinities with missing values, right? So let's say, we'll just call this logged for now. Um, so what we want to do is we want to go for each column, which is for each sample, and we want to look at exactly this distribution, um, but all at the same time. So uh, pandas has this nice method called iter items for that. And what iter items will do, let's just grab, we can replace this big long ugly thing with the variable. Uh, Let's do that. Cool. Um, so what it'll do is it'll basically chop up your data frame uh, into the columns and it'll give you, it'll pass you two things at once. It'll pass you the column name and then the actual series, which is the column. So column name, then here's the series, that's the column. Column name, series, that's the column. So this is really nice for looking at things column by column. Uh, and so what we can do is we can actually just overlap all of these distributions onto the same disk plot. So if you keep plotting sns.displot, it'll just keep plotting it onto the same axis, which is really nice. Um, you have to do this drop NA thing because uh, displot doesn't know what to do with NAs. So if I if I remove that, nope, never mind. Okay, there's no no missing values. That can't be right. All right, I don't know why that is, but anyway, <laughs> that's strange. There should be missing values. Um, maybe they updated that. Uh, okay, so now we can see that um, all of our samples have basically the same distribution, which is actually really nice um, because uh, it means that we're not we're not getting one sample that has you know tons of reads in one gene, but no none in other genes. So that's good. Um, so let's do some filtering. Let's filter for low coverage here. Uh, so just somewhat arbitrarily, I decided to pick um, to remove genes with fewer than 130 reads total, which is an average of about 10 reads per sample. So if you go back to this, um, this distribution here, that's like cutting off sort of right around here. So all of this junk back here that's extremely low and zero inflated, we're gonna, we're gonna remove that. Um, so again, there's different ways we can do this, but I really like this uh, lock dot lock filtering uh, method. So you can say um, for the sum, uh, you know, the sum per gene, the sum sum across rows um, that are greater than the minimum reads, which up here I sent I set to 130. Oop. So let's just take a look at what that looks like. Oh yeah. Uh, again, that's just like a series of true false, but it has it's attached to the index, so we can use this. Um, so it's saying only give me rows where the sum of the row is larger than this value that I set. 
and it's implicitly, but I'll here, I'll make it explicit, it's implicitly saying, give me all the columns. Um, so after we do that filtering, now we just have 15,000 genes. So now we have these sort of high coverage um, genes. So let's look at this on a sample by sample basis again. Here, let's do this logged thing. Okay, so we again set, uh, so now we have this filtered DF, we again take the log 10 and all that stuff, and we're uh, iterating over the columns. Um, and you can see that, um, yeah, so basically we got rid of, I uh, should have made it side by side, but here we got rid of sort of all this junk down here. Um, so even though it still has this sort of weird bimodal distribution thing, uh, it's a lot, it's the, the, the majority of the genes now per sample are in this nice normal, like normal distribution looking chunk over here, which is great. Um, what we can do is further look for missing values. Um, so this is the sum across all of the samples, right? But let's say, let's say a gene just has 130 reads in one sample of a treatment, but for the other three replicates of that treatment and everything else is zero, right? We don't really want that either. Um, so we can look at, um, what we can do is we can do this uh, df equal to zero thing. Um, and again, this will give us now a big data frame of true and false, right? Uh, and basically we can treat this, I mean, as you can see, it is a data frame, right? So we can treat this, you put it in parentheses, but we can treat this with all the same methods that we would for any other data frame. So we can say zeros per column, so that would be the default sum. Um, and you can see the number of genes that have zero per column here looks pretty standard, and we're going to plot that in a second. Um, or you can say the number of zeros or missing values across um, adding up all the columns. So, uh, you know, for this isn't going to, we can't really look at this, um, you know, element by element. So this we're just going to look at the distribution here. So I set these equal to zeros per sample, zeros per gene. Um, and basically just doing these two distribution plots. So, so if you don't want things plotted over the same um, axis, you can write plot.show and then plot.close. So this will show you the plot, but then it'll shut it down so that you can't add anything more on top of it. Um, and then you can start a new plot here. Um, so this is, and, and we don't really want to plot these on the same axes because you can see this is between zero and 150. This is between zero and eight. So we really don't want to look at this at the same time. Um, okay, so all the samples are pretty nicely grouped together. It doesn't seem like there's a bunch of big outliers anywhere. Um, here I just looked at a zero to 310 because it gets, um, you know, a little, uh, there's a long tail, like, like with many things when you're looking at RNA-seq in genes. Um, but basically, you know, most genes are, are there in at least, uh, in at, at least, what, 13 minus 8, so five samples. <laughs> that took a long time. Okay, so let's look at, um, let's filter for genes that are non-zero in at least four samples. I think this is, um, I think this is all the genes actually at this point. Uh, and the reason we're we're looking for that is because again the number like each of our treatment groups has four or five replicates so we really want genes that are at least in all the replicates from one treatment um okay so again there's multiple different ways we can do this uh we can say okay for the df for the values that are equal to zero give me the sum across um all samples and make sure that that's less than nine uh we can say for the values that are not equal to zero, make sure the sum across all samples is greater than or equal to four. Um, or we can do this, this one, which uh, actually for right now, I'm not gonna suggest because it'll replace, um, it'll introduce missing values into your data frame, which you don't really want. Uh, but so you can say, okay, replace zero with missing value and then drop any row that has a missing value in more than four samples. Um, so this drop in a thing is super useful. You can use it for dropping columns that are all, or columns or rows that are all missing values that have any missing values, which definitely comes up um, as necessary if you're doing machine learning. Um, 
But this Thresh thing, I always have to look this up. If you're in Jupyter Lab, I'm not sure if this is the same in VS Code, but if, but if you're in Jupyter Lab, you can press uh, Shift Tab when you're inside or not. Oh no. Never mind. Okay, well, you can, uh, if you ever need help with something, you can always um, do that. Uh, you can always just do help like this also. Um, or look it up on the internet, which is what I normally do. Um, so this drop in a thing is very useful. That's, that's all I'm trying to say. And that um, you can, uh, all right, I'll, I'll skip this. Basically, you can you can give it this threshold for the minimum number of non-missing values you need in order to keep that, and that's very helpful. Or you can give it a column name and say drop anything where this column has a missing value, which is also very useful. Okay. Um, cool. So I think I think this had no effect. Uh, so before it was fifteen thousand four hundred six rows. We're still at fifteen thousand four hundred six rows, so that's great. Um, so now we're going to get into, okay, so now we've done some, basically some filtering on the data to get it to a point that we want to start um, doing some analysis on it. So you definitely don't want to do filtering after you've done analysis because you really run the risk of um, basically filtering until you see what you want to see. Uh, and so you don't want to do that, right? You want to filter using best practices for maximizing coverage and all of these things. Uh, and then do your statistical test after, so that you're not conforming the data set to fit your, you know, hypotheses. Um, okay, so one last really important piece that we need to do is um, basically sample normalization. So, uh, you know, we have to correct for the different coverage that we see in these different samples. So let's look at, let's just grab this down here again. So while these samples actually look um, really very good in terms of having similar distributions of gene counts, they are slightly shifted from each other, right? So you can see that this green sample slightly shifted up, this orange sample is slightly shifted down, the purple sample probably has the fewest reads of all. Uh, and we don't really want to be finding differences of treatment groups that just have to do with which sample got more reads in the experiment, right? So we're going to have to um, uh, do some normalization in, in order to counter that. Um, okay, so the other way, so this is just looking at distributions. Another way to look at um, similarities and differences in a, in a, how to say this, like in a summarizing kind of way is to look at a principal component analysis. Um, so I'm not really going to go over in detail what a PCA is, you know, hopefully, I, I think probably most of you sort of have at least a gut understanding of what it is. Um, but I do want to go to this website, which I really, really like for when I'm trying to remind myself what PCA is. Oh, I hope it opens. Hmm. Awesome. Um, right. Okay, so this is the original set, right? So let's say you have these five samples and you have two features, let's say two genes that you measured, X and Y. Uh, what PCA does is it maintains all of the exact relationships that you had in your data set from your original um, data, but it scales and uh, sort of re choose up your features or your genes so that um, the first PC captures the most variation, the second principal component captures the second most variation, and these are all orthogonal to each other. So that's, yeah, that's the part where it gets confusing, I think. So if you go to this website, what you can do is you can actually move around your data and it'll change the PC based on, it'll change the PCA based on um, what you do. So here, you know, right now this axis here is basically our PC1, right? If you look at, if you look at this, but if we make more variation in this direction, now this is our PC1. We've, we've changed it so this over here is our PC1. Uh, so that's principal component analysis. It's just a way of embedding your uh, samples in 2D space by just taking the first two principal components um, and visualizing the variation in your data set that way. Um, and so to do principal component analysis, 
we are going to use this decomposition submodule of scikit-learn. Um, so let's check out uh, what this is. So scikit-learn um, has a very, uh, uh, like a very similar structure for almost all of its, um, all of the things you want to use from it. So here's the PCA thing, but almost everything, almost any machine learning model, any decomposition you'd want to do, any clustering you want to do has, has basically this as its workflow, where it has a class. Um, I don't, I don't think we've talked too much about classes, but basically it's, you can think of it as like an object. It's like a variable, right? Uh, where, which you will instantiate um, as into, into a variable. So let's say I was just to run this. Now we have this PCA object uh, and it's just, it just holds the parameters for how we want to run the PCA. On this object, we can run things like fit um, on, let's say, our data. So, so an, another important thing with sklearn and almost, I mean, tons of other software is in, in biology, we often think of data tables as samples, as columns, and genes or features as rows. In machine learning, it's always exactly flipped, where it's always features are different columns and samples are um, rows, different, different samples and different um, sort of replicates or rows. Uh, so for, to get things into the right, um, format, we can use transpose. So now that's, you know, same data tables, just sort of flipped on that, uh, pivoted on that corner. Um, and so we're going to take this PCA object and do run fit transform with the df dot transpose. And what this will do is nothing if we do dot fit. But now we have, um, now this Ah, sorry, let me, let me do this again. So if we do this, uh, we can try to say, for instance, um, what is the, you can, you can try to ask like, what is the explained variance of each principal component, right? Oop. The problem is it has no attribute explained variance ratio. However, if you fit data to it, oop. Now it has that, right? So now we now this model has additional attributes that come from fitting data. Uh, however, it doesn't actually contain this principal component transformed um, version of your data. So for that, we want to use this fit transform function, and this will actually rather than just affecting like rather than like returning self and just giving you back this PCA thing, this actually gives you um, a an array right so now this this spits out a uh it doesn't just fit the pca to your data it transforms your data into principal component space um so now and because we have two principal components it, it has two columns and so now this is your um 13 samples represented in pr principal component space uh, so we can save that in PCA transformed underscore pre norm because we're going to normalize the data later and I want to compare the two. Um, another element of this, sorry, that I skipped over a little bit is this scipy.stats.z score. So z scoring is a way of um, getting all of your data to get, have the same mean and the same standard deviation, and specifically the mean, a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Um, and the way you do that is you, um, so, th so this actually uh, just gives you an array like this. Um, but it will, uh, for each row, is this true? Uh, whatever. Okay, it'll uh, give you, um, it'll subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation for each sample. And specifically, we need the transpose data frame here as well. Um, or you can, um, give, again, this like axis equals one um, argument for the z-score. Uh, so 
it's really nice to scale your data before doing any kind of machine learning, including decomposition or principal component analysis. Okay, so we have the z-score data, which is in an array. We're gonna fit transform it using principal component analysis, and we're gonna save it in, um, in this variable here. Uh, okay, so this is just an array. I find this hard to look at. I don't like, I don't, I never like, this is a personal preference. I don't really like looking at NumPy arrays or having them around because I'm worried that I'll forget what the columns mean and what the rows mean. So what I like to do is put them into a pandas data frame. And it's, again, very easy to do. So you can just give it the, this table itself. You can say for the index. So, we, uh, so here's our DF again. So this is not transposed, right? I'm just, every time I'm throwing it in here, I'm temporarily transposing it just to give it into that function. Um, so we can say the index of this is 13 is represents our 13 samples. So um, that's that would be our df.columns. And then the columns are the principal components one and principal component two. So now we have um, uh, so now we have this as a data frame. So here, I'll split this up a little bit. Um, okay, so as a data frame, now we can make a little bit of sense of that, right? So we have our different samples um, in, in our principal component space. And the other thing I want to do is I want to overlay, um, I want to know where these samples are on our PCA in terms of what kind, what the experiment was on them, right? Uh, so, I think we're doing good on time. Okay. So, just to remind you, we made this experimental. Uh, sorry, one moment. I just need to put that in there. Uh, we have this experimental design table, um, which has, if you look at it, the exact same index, or at least um, a comparable index to our PCA. So I don't, I never like to assume that somehow things didn't get reordered. I don't want to have to remember, oh, did I sort it by this or did I not sort it by this? You know, I don't want to assume that um, I hadn't mixed up the things and just assign another column. So instead I use this um, concatenation uh, function. So what uh, pd.concat takes is um, a list of multiple data frames. So here I'm going to take the experimental design data frame um, as well as this, uh, the PCA data frame. Um, because I, again, because I want to concatenate it as columns and not just uh, you know, add it together as rows, I want to concatenate it this way. I'm going to say axis equals one. Um, and you can also say, you know, let's say they don't share all the same indexes, but you only want the common ones. You can say join is equal to inner. So, you know, again, like back to sets from high school, inner means just take the, the intersection of the common indices here because they, they have the exact same indexes, it shouldn't matter. You could also say outer, it, it won't have an effect. And that's take the, you know, take the union of all the indexes. Um, and so what that'll do is it'll, now we have the PC1, PC2, as well as these different sample annotations in the same data frame. Cool. Um, okay, so I'm going to again set that to our, um, this exact same variable. And now we're going to do something, um, we're going to use LMplot, which I believe stands for linear model plot. Uh, it's, it's somewhat similar to regplot, except for um, two major differences. Yeah, there's there's a few major differences. The fun functionally, the main major difference is that for LMplot, you have to provide it. You have to be plotting two columns from the same data frame. So this is why I this is why I needed to actually concatenate these data frame. So you have to you have to actually say here's the data I want to come from, where I want this to come from, and I want to plot this column and this column. Another element from LMplot that is very uh, very very useful is that you can provide it a third variable. I think we, we talked about this last week. You can provide it a third variable called hue. Um, and so this can be another column and this will color the dots differently depending on this column. So usually, I mean, usually you wanna provide a categorical um, column for that. 
So now we can plot where all the samples are um, in PC space. Ah, okay. So if you're familiar with PCA, um, you know that each PC, each principal component represents a different amount of the variance of your data set, right? So I really like actually keeping track of this, right? Because if things separate on PC1, but it only explains 5% of the variance, that's not very meaningful, right? Or same with PC2. Um, so I really like to um, actually write on the plot how much of the explained variance it is. Uh, and again, you can, that's held in this explained variance ratio uh, attribute of the original model. So this is now a parameter of the model. Um, yeah, so this is just, you know, the explained variance from each of the PCs that you calculated. And um, so what I have here, this is, a, I think it's called string comprehension. This is saying, um, whenever you see a, in a string, you see a percent sign, it's saying, okay, take whatever is after the string and sort of dump it in there. And this dot to F says, uh, give me two decimal places of float, um, of a float, of how you'd print a float for, for this. So, you know, PC1, oh, this should say PC2. Um, okay, so what can we, what information can we glean from this principal component? For one thing, um, the no pep and one pep, um, which are two control conditions, are separate from the multi pep, which is great. The bad part, however, is that this, you know, PC1 explains the most variance, right? Um, but this multi-pep, uh, these multi-pep samples are actually more separating on PC1 than the different, than the two treatments are. You're getting more difference between uh, replicates than you are between treatments. So that's not good. Um, so, from this, I think we, we uh, can determine that we definitely want to normalize our samples. So this is before we've normalized for coverage per sample, right? Even though the, in that histogram up here, um, there were very small differences between the samples, maybe those coverage differences are actually leading to big differences in PC space. Um, yeah, so one more element. Okay, I'll save that. But so, so this kind of um, workflow is extremely common for scikit-learn things, where you first instantiate the model and you give it some parameters. And then to actually have the model transform or affect your data or fit to your data in some way, you're gonna run a method like fit or fit transform. Um, and then you'll get things, you can get attributes out of the model. But the model itself is not holding your data. It's, it's just the model itself. Okay, so let's figure out how to normalize these samples, right? So, it's, all right, so this is just the same distribution plot again. So I wrote a little function here. Um, you'll notice that most of this stuff has not been written into functions. And the reason for that is um, basically this is all sort of custom data that, you, uh, sorry, custom analysis that you're gonna wanna do for every single data set. And it's gonna be a little bit different based on what you see in your data set. You know, you don't want to, you don't wanna automate this stuff because what if your next data set has two genes that are outliers or no genes that are outliers or things like that? You know, you actually want to do this step by step and are looking at the data at each step. Um, column normalization, I think, is a more common, um, is a common thing. So this is now a uh, function that I might put somewhere else and use it repeatedly, right? So what I put here is I put um, four different methods for how to normalize uh, for coverage on uh, based on columns. The first way is kind of like um, you might have seen like TPM or you know counts per million CPM uh, RP RPKM which is uh, reads per kilobase million. Um, so this is kind of similar to that where I'm dividing each column by the number of reads um, in that column and then multiplying it here by a thousand. So this is counts per thousand. Um, yeah. uh, so in a perfect world, if read count perfectly affected every gene separately, this should be a perfect normalization strategy. Unfortunately, we know that's not really the case. And so we're gonna try a few different um, methods here. 
So here, this is um, just median, uh, basically median centering. So what I'm going to do is divide each column by its median gene count. Uh, and so what this will do is um, set every median, uh, every, uh, yeah, the, the median gene count of every sample at one. The problem with this, as we saw, is that the median is not, this isn't, you know, this isn't a beautifully normally distributed kind of thing per sample. So the median is going to be sort of differently on this weird slide slope, side slope for each of these samples. So I don't know if this is going to work so well either. Um, another thing we can try is median of ratios. Uh, this is something that I believe is used in DSeq2 for normalization. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to go over this that much, but you can dig into it if you, if you like. Uh, and then we can also do quantile normalization. Um, and this is where this pre-processing submodule from sklearn comes in. Um, so you can, uh, this has this quantile transform function uh, and you can give it your data frame. You can tell it how many quantiles. So what quantile normalization does is it basically says, okay, the lowest number in this column is gonna be the lowest. We're, we're gonna set all the lowest numbers to zero. Then we're gonna set all the second lowest numbers to point one. We're going to set all the third lowest numbers to point two, you know, things like that. Um, and so to, we're going to say, give it as many quantiles as there are genes so that we aren't losing any resolution in differences between genes. Um, and we're going to say, make it into a normal distribution at the end, which is, which is great. Um, so we're going to save that in this temporary thing. This again saves as a NumPy array. So we're going to give it back its index and columns. We're going to say, return that. Uh, okay, so what I did here is I made a slightly more complicated um, uh, figure. Um, so Matplotlib has this really nice um, function called subplots. And what we can do is basically make four axes, uh, like instantiate four axes um, next to each other. And they're, they're going to be, we know they're going to be lined up perfectly and they can even share a y axis. So this is saying to share the y axis. Um, and then you can plot different things on each of those four, four plots and have them be nice and lined up. So we're gonna try all the different um, normalization methods and see how they work. Uh, and this is just saying make this 20 inches wide and three inches tall. Uh, so let's look at, um, I'm just going to comment this out really quick and just say print i and method. So I really like this enumerate function. This is a built-in function in Python. And what it does is if you give it uh, some iterable, uh, iterable in this for loop, um, it doesn't just iterate through the actual elements of the thing. It'll also say which, it'll basically give you like a counter next to that. It'll say this was the zeroth element, the first element, second, third, et cetera. So what we can do is we can use, um, that i to iterate through these axes. So the subplots uh, function gives you a figure, which basically I've never used this variable, but it's what it gives you. Um, and it gives you the four axes. And so you can say, okay, I want the first axis by saying you take these axes and you take the if one of them, you know, for each uh, method of normalization that we're going to look at. Um, then we're going to use this function that I made here. Um, and we're gonna give it the method as well as the data frame itself. Uh, and that we're gonna save in this normed variable. Um, and then this is just a, a you know, piece of code that I stole from up here. This is saying per sample um, plot, the, plot the read distribution. Um, and to make it actually plot onto these four plots next to each other, we're gonna say what axis to give it. Um, so this is the keyword for dist plot, and this is the keyword for most um, seaborne plots. You can tell it what axis to plot things on. And we, this is a variable called ax, sorry if this is a little confusing. This is how we would do this. Let's do it like this so it's a little clearer. Um, this is the variable axis for which one to plot on top of. Uh, uh, and now we're going to have to change all these two. Okay. So this is just, um, it's taking a second. Okay. So this is just plotting raw read counts, right? 
Uh, so we're getting this super zero inflated thing for almost all of the methods, uh, except for the quantile normalization, which again will force a normal distributed um, lined up thing here. Uh, okay, so let's maybe plot instead of just the raw counts. This is, this is I just copy pasted all of this code down here. Um, but I'm also, uh, sorry, so here I actually made five columns instead of four. And the first plot, the first axis, um, I'm just plotting the non-normalized stuff. And I'm plotting this, I'm plotting log two, sorry. But I'm plotting log, the log counts um, from the raw data. So we can compare with that. Then here, because the first axis is taken, I'm gonna do um, I plus one. And then this is again, just like identical code, just with the log, um, logged uh, data. Um, okay, so now we can see, uh, all right, just very quickly, let me ask, um, does anyone want me to go over this subplots command again and how and how to use it? Or does anyone have questions about this, about how we're plotting um, five different things next to each other? Okay, great. Yeah, please, please ask follow-up questions if you're interested. Um, okay. Yeah, so here, so, so, you know, most of this stuff is just doing things like setting the title or setting the label, things like that. Um, okay, so here uh, we have the non-normalized data, we have the counts per thousand, we have median normalized, median of ratios normalized or quantile normalized. Uh, and basically you can see all of this sort of like fuzzy non-overlapping stuff is gone in pretty much all of them. Um, however, I wanna try one more thing. Um, I would like to not just plot the log two. So here's the log two of the data of the data frame where we've replaced infinities with missing values. Uh, but I also want to um, take the z-score. So not so looking at uh, the relative contribution of each gene because right now we're trying to plot um, on top of each other genes that have you know an average of five counts and genes that have an average of five million counts. So we want to, uh, you know, um, if we z-score those, now everything's sort of on the same range. Um, so sorry, this is a little complicated. Uh, feel free to, you know, go back over this, but it's basically, you know, we, we, look, we look outside um, in order of the uh, parentheses. So first we logged it, then we replaced infinities with nans, then we're z-scoring. And here, because I didn't transpose the data frame, we're z-scoring um, with axis equals to one. Um, and I want to, because I in introduced some missing values, I want to say ignore the nans. So ignore missing values. Uh, so we're making the exact same set of plots, again, just with the z-scored data. And this is really where um, I think differences in normalization really start to come out more strongly. So we're non-normalized, you can start to see how different samples are really wildly different from each other. Um, if we just go by counts, you know, counts per, counts per gene per thousand reads, um, this is, uh, we, we still see some, some pretty severe differences. Uh, basically, we, we're, see, we're seeing differences with each method. Um, yeah, I think, I think they're all valid methods and it's just a question of uh, sort of what you, what you want. Um, so I'm, we're gonna go forward with the quantile normalization because I think that, that gives us the really nice property of um, normal, normal distributions. Uh, and we're not just going to do the column normalized with uh, the quantile method, but we're also going to z-score things. Um, so we're gonna define this normed uh, data frame. We're gonna give it back its index, give it back its columns, because this, whoop, uh, again, is just a, an array like that. And so I like to keep track of the index and the columns in case things get uh, mixed up. 
Okay, so let's see how um, normalization affected the PCA. So here I have uh, this PCA pre-norm up here. Uh, so this is, again, just copy pasted from above. I just grabbed that same scrap of code. Um, yeah, and because we didn't, we, we saved this in a new variable called normed, we can, you know, we can basically recalculate this from uh, the DF. Though actually, we, we don't actually have to recalculate any of this. I think we can just, because this is already a saved variable. Yeah, we already have this. Great. Um, here we, we do need to recalculate we, on the normed um, data. So again, we have to transpose it. You have to do this fit transform, put it into a data frame, um, and then concatenate it with the experimental design. Uh, and so now let's compare these two um, PCAs. So again, this is what the PCA looked like before. And now after normalization, um, the main, uh, you know, 45% of the variance is between the two um, the treatment groups, which is great. And even our uh, two different control groups are sort of commingling in the PCA, which means that they are, um, they're, they're, which means that the variance between them is nothing compared to the variance of our, our group of interest. So that's really good too. Okay, so, uh, so we got some good news there. Okay, so this is the last thing we're going to do. I think, I think in the last nine minutes, this is doable. Um, but this is, uh, I think everything up to here is just really important stuff to do anytime you get your hands on a new data set. You know, you wanna know, has it been through Excel? Um, are you getting a ton of zero inflated things? Are you getting sample, you know, PCA is really good to look at. Are you getting samples that are totally off the PCA and totally driving all the variants in your data set? You know, these are, these are really important things to look for. Um, okay, but so now we have normalized data that groups well in the PCA, that's filtered, that's transformed, that's z-scored, everything like that. Um, so let's uh, run some tests, right? So the goal of what we wanted to do was to find what's unique to exhausted T cells versus non-stimulated or stimulated once T cells. Um, there's different ways to do this and machine learning, uh, which we're gonna cover on Thursday, how to do that is definitely one of the ways. Um, but here we're just gonna do some T tests. We're gonna say what genes are enriched in or depleted in the multi-PEP T cells versus not, right? Um, so first we can uh, do these um, treatment groups. So what we can do is, um, let's just remind ourselves what experimental design looks like. It looks like this, right? So we can group this by treatment. So that's what this means. But basically what this will generate is this group by object, right? And there's lots of different things you can do with a group by object. It's just grouping things that have the same treatment, right? Um, but one of the things that's super useful is you can get this groups um, attribute. And what this will do is it'll basically turn it into a dictionary where, um, where uh, it'll pull out each of the values here and then um, the value for each key in this dictionary is which indices have that as um, have that as the value, right? So here the multi-pep not is has multi-pep, et cetera. Um, what's great is that this, again, this table matches our data table. And so we're gonna be able to use these as our treatment groups. So that's, that's just a really quick, nice way to, now we have a dictionary of all the treatment groups. Okay, so let's do, um, Let's do a t-test. Uh, so we have this normed data set, right? And basically we wanna say, we wanna grab um, all of the samples in that, ha that were treated with the multi-PEP. Um, so basically we save, we save this up here in treatment groups, right? So we're gonna take treatment groups, give it the key multi-PEP. Oh, we didn't save this. Um, give it the key multi-PEP, and this is its value, right? So this is all of the samples that we'd like. Um, so we can basically give that to, this is, this is a, a list of um, column names. So this is now grabbing all of the multi-PEP columns um, from this data table, right? Um, the other way to write this would be dot lock, give me all the rows, give me these columns, right? But I, but it's, uh, a little less verbose to just uh, use this single brackets thing. Um, so what we want, so what we're going to do here is we're going to use this apply method, which is um, the best, the best thing in the whole world. And what apply will do is 
whatever function you give it, it will apply that to either um, every column on its own or every row on its own. So again, because we're going across the data table, we're doing something to all the different columns per row. Uh, we're going to give this apply this axis equals one um, keyword down here. Uh, but the main thing that you give apply is a lambda function. So this lambda function, we can even run this because it just returns a function. Um, it says uh, for um, basically if you put in, uh, this is what you put into the function. Um, and this is what you get out of the function. So here's what we're going to do. If we get a row, I want you to grab all of the, um, so basically what this is doing is passing in each row of your data frame as a series. And the series have, uh, you can actually call them by name, right? You can call them by uh, which sample they come from. So uh, you can say, take all of the ones in the, all of the samples from Multipep, all those values, compare them to all of the samples from the one uh, treatment with one uh, peptide. Um, and these are the two sets of values that we want to put into scipy.stats.ttestEnd, which is um, a t-test, it'll calculate the t-test. Now what this, uh, what this actually spits out is um, two values. It spits out, I look this up every time for the order, the T statistic as well as the P value. So I, I'm kind of interested in both of these things. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take what that spits out, which is basically a tuple um, for each row. I'm gonna say, turn that into a series. And what that'll do is now, because each row has been turned into series, it'll actually output a data frame. Um, so we can say, we can instantiate the data frame and then say for its two columns, T statistic and P value, um, uh, take the output of this apply function. This is a little complicated. I hope you, it doesn't need, you know, you don't have to do things um, spitting out into the whole data frame. You can also, let's say you just care about the P value. Oh, this is gonna take a second. I'm just going to stop that. Um, what you can do is uh, you don't have to turn it into a series. Um, and you can just take the second thing that it spits out, which will be index one. And so this will create a p value. Ooh, my computer's not very happy about this. Um, Okay, so I'm not I'm not actually going to run this, uh, but I'll but this is I mean all this code works. I tested it, so you can run it on your own. So I'm just going to skip ahead. Um, so this is the so this is saving the statistics for um, multi pep. Yeah, I could probably do that. Uh, so this is saving the statistics for multi pep versus uh, one peptide treatment. I did the copy paste the exact same thing, but I changed this to no pep and saved this in a data frame, which is versus no pep. Um, and then I made this uh, dictionary, which is um, save it just as a way to have both data frames sort of in one um, object. Uh, and what I wanted to do is correct these for multiple hypothesis testing. So, um, hmm. Okay, I feel like I don't, I don't totally have enough time. We're basically at the end of the lecture. Basically, uh, what I wanted, I, all I did here was I multiplied by um, the number of genes that we actually tested. So that's, um, what is that? That's the Bonferroni correction. Um, and then I clipped, uh, you know, took, I, you don't want the probability going above one. So I said, if it's um, above one, just clip it at one. Um, you can do the signed, the sort of signed p-value thing, which I like a lot, which is where, uh, you basically multiply the log 10, negative log 10 of the p-value, which I'm sure a lot of people are used to looking at, right? Um, and you multiply it by the t-statistic divided by the absolute value of the t-statistic. Um, and what this will do is if it's depleted, it'll make your FDR negative. And if it's enriched, it'll make your FDR positive. So it's a really nice way to sort of look at both the direction and the value of the um, enrichment. And then what I did here is I grabbed these data frames, both of them, and I, again, this reg plot, so you can just give it two vectors and it'll plot the one versus the other. Um, and I'm plotting the signed FDR. So probably what I should do here is give it good labels. So uh, so what's really, oh, sorry, <laughs> oh, no. Okay, what was cool about that though is that it was a, uh, um, 
they were always going in the same direction, right? Which means that compared to either control, our uh, treatment was doing the same thing. And so that means that they're, two, they're both good controls to look at. Uh, and so now if you wanna find things that are unique, you can find the genes that are in that you know, high FDR or very low FDR in terms of that sign FDR compared to both things. Um, yeah, so that's, that's actually all I have uh, for you today. Great, it was perfect, right down to the wire. A little bit rushed at the end, sorry about that. But yeah, I really suggest going back over to this t-test thing and trying to understand this code. Um, I'll add in more comments about it, uh, uh, about what each step is doing so that it's, um, you, you don't get lost and then I'll upload that. So if you wanna get, you can also, you can always like get check out again or just download it from the GitHub. Um, yeah, please, uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions um, and thank you all for your attention. Thanks. <laughs>